Hello, and welcome to Historical Humans Reads, where we take primary sources and bring them to your screen. I'm Cullum Coleman, and today we are reading From the Golden Ass by Apuleius. Originally known as the Metamorphoses of Apuleius, it was renamed the Golden Ass in the late 4th century CE by St. Augustine of Hippo. This 2nd century CE novel is the only Latin novel to survive to the present day in its entirety. It follows a man named Lucius who, through his insatiable desire to study magic, accidentally transforms himself into a donkey and embarks on a journey consisting of a series of tales to restore his human form. Today we will be reading Book 1, Parts 1 through 10 of The Golden Ass. With that, let's begin. Now, I'd like to string together various tales in the Milesian style and charm your kindly air with seductive murmurs so long as you're ready to be amazed at human forms and fortunes changed radically and then restored in turn mutual exchange. And don't object to reading Egyptian papyri inscribed by a sly reed from the Nile. I'll begin. Who am I? I'll tell you briefly. Hymetus near Athens, the Isthmus of Chorus, and Spartan Mount Teneris, happy soil more happily buried forever in other books. That's my lineage. There, as a lad, I served in my first campaigns with the Greek tongue. Later, in Rome, freshly come to Latin studies, I assumed and cultivated the native language without a teacher and with a heap of pains. So there, I beg your indulgence in advance, if as crude a performer in the exotic speech of the forum as I offend. And in truth, the very fact of a change of voice will answer like a circus rider's skill when needed. We are about to embark on a Greek tale. Reader, attend and find a light. Thessaly, where the roots of my mother's family add to my glory, in the famous form of Plutarch, and later his nephew, Sextus the Philosopher, Thessaly, is where I was off to on business, emerging from perilous mountain tracks and slithery valley ones, and damp meadows and muddy fields, riding a pure white local nag, he being fairly tired and to chase away my own fatigue from endless sitting with the labor of walking, I dismounted. I rubbed the sweat from his forehead, carefully stroked his ears, loosed his bridle, and led him slowly along at a gentle pace, till the usual and natural remedy of grazing eliminated the inconvenience of his lassitude. While he was at his mobile breakfast, the grass he passed, contorting his head from side to side, I made a third to two travelers who chanced to be a little way ahead. As I tried to hear what they were saying, one of them burst out laughing. Stop telling such absurd and monstrous lies. Hearing this, my thirst for anything new being what it is, I said, Oh, do let me share your conversation. I am not inquisitive, but I love to know everything or at least most things. Besides, the charm of a pleasant tale will lighten the pain of this hill we're climbing. But the one who'd laughed merrily went on. Now that story was about as true as if you'd said magic spells can make rivers flow backwards, chain the sea, paralyze the wind, halt the sun, squeeze dew from the moon, disperse the stars, banish day and lengthen night. Here I spoke out more boldly. Don't be annoyed, you who began this tale. Don't be wary of spinning the rest. And, the, uh, and to the other, you with your stubborn mind and cloth ears might be rejecting something true. By Hercules, it's not too clever if wrong opinion makes you judge as false what seems new to the ear or strange to the eye or too hard for the intellect to grasp, but which on closer investigation proves not only true, but even obvious. 
I last night competing with friends at dinner took too large a mouthful of cheese polenta. That soft and glutinous food stuck in my throat, blocked my windpipe, and I almost died. Yet at Athens not long ago, in front of the painted porch, I saw a juggler swallow a sharp-edged cavalry sword with its lethal blade. And later I saw the same fellow, after a little donation, ingest a spear, death-dealing end downwards, right to the depth of his guts. And, all of a sudden, a beautiful boy swarmed up with the wooden bit of the upside-down weapon, where it rose from throat to brow and danced a dance, all twists and turns, as if he'd no muscle or spine, astounding everyone there. You'd have said he was that noble snake that clings with slippery knots to Asclepius' staff, the knotty one he carries with the sawn off branches. But do go on now, you who started this tale. Tell it again. I'll believe you not like him and invite you to dinner with me at the first tavern we come to after reaching town. There's your guaranteed reward. What you promise, he said, is fair and just, and I'll repeat what I left unfinished. But first I swear to you by the all-seeing God of the sun, I'm speaking things I know to be true, and you'll have no doubt when you arrive at the next Cethalian town and find the story on everyone's lips of happening in plain daylight. But first, so you know who I am, I'm from Aegeum, and here's how I make my living. I deal cheese and honey, all that sort of innkeeper stuff, traveling here and through Boeotia, Aetolia, Thessaly. So when I learned that at Hypata, Thessaly's most important town. Some fresh cheese with fine flavor was being sold at a very good price. I rushed there, in a hurry, to buy a lot. But as usual, I went left foot first, and my hopes of a profit were dashed. A wholesale dealer called Lupus had snapped it up the day before. So exhausted after my useless chase, I started to walk to the baths as Venus began to shine. Suddenly I caught sight of my old friend Socrates, sitting on the ground, half concealed in a ragged old cloak, so pale I hardly knew him, sadly thin and shrunken, like one of those fate discards to beg at street corners. In that state, even though I knew him well, I approached him with doubt in my mind. Well, Socrates, my friend, what's happened? How dreadful you look, what shame. Back home, they've already mourned and given you up for dead. By the provincial judge's decree, guardians have been appointed for your children and your wife, the funeral service done, her looks marred by endless tears and grief, her sight nearly lost from weeping, is being urged by her parents to ease the family misfortune with the joy of a fresh marriage. And here you are, looking like a ghost to our utter shame. Aristomenes, he said, you cannot know the slippery turns of fortune the shifting assaults, the string of reverses. With that, he threw his tattered cloak over a face that long since had blushed with embarrassment, leaving the rest of himself from navel to thighs bare. I could endure the sight of such a terrible suffering no longer, grasped him, and tried to set him on his feet. But he remained as he was, his head shrouded and cried, No, no, let fate have no more joy of the spoil she puts on display. I made him follow me, and removing one or two of my garments, closed him hastily, or rather hid him, and dragged him off to the baths in a trice. I found myself what was needed for oiling and dying, and with effort scraped off the solid layers of dirt. That done, I carried him off to an inn, tired myself, supporting his exhausted frame with some effort, I laid him on the bed, filled him with food, relaxed him with wine, and soothed him with talk. Now he was ready for conversation, laughter, a witty joke, even some modest repartee, when suddenly a painful sob rose from the depths of his chest, and he beat his brow savagely with his hand. Woe is me, he cried. I was chasing after the delights of a famous gladiatorial show, 
when I fell into this misfortune. For, as you know well, I'd gone to Macedonia on a business trip, and after nine months laboring there, I was on my way back home a wealthier man. Just before I reached Larissa, where I was going to watch the show by the way, walking along a rough and desolate valley, I was attacked by fierce bandits and stripped of all I had. At last I escaped, weak as I was, and reached an inn belonging to a mature yet very attractive woman named Moreau, and told her about my lengthy journey, my desire for home, and the wretched robbery. She treated me more than kindly, with a welcome and a generous meal, and, quickly aroused by lust, steered me to her bed. At once I was done for, the moment I slept with her. That one bout infected me with a long and pestilential relationship. She even had the clothes those kind robbers left me, and the meager wages I've earned heaving sacks while I still could, until at last evil fortune and my good wife reduced me to the state you saw not long ago. By Pollux, I said, you deserve the worst, if there's anything worse than what you got, for preferring the joys of Venus and a wrinkled whore to your home and kids. But shocked and stunned, he placed his index finger to his lips. Quiet, quiet, he said, then glancing round and making sure it was safe to speak. Beware of the, a woman with magical powers, lest your intemperate speech do you a mischief. Really, I said, what sort of a woman is this high and mighty innkeeper? A witch, he said, with divine powers to lower the sky and halt the globe, make fountains stone and melt the mountains, raise the ghosts and summon the gods, extinguish the stars and illuminate Tartarus itself. Oh, come, said I, dispense with the melodrama and away the stage scenery. Use the common tongue. Do you, he replied, wish to hear one or two or more of her doings? Because the fact she can make all men fall for her, and not just the locals, but Indians and Ethiopian savages of Orient and Occident, and even men who live on the opposite side of the earth. That's only a type of her art, the merest bagatelle. Just listen to what she's perpetrated in front of witnesses. One of her lovers had misbehaved with someone else. So with a thing, single word, she changed him into a beaver, a creature that, fearing capture, escapes from the hunters by biting off its own testicles to confuse the hounds with their scent. And she intended the same for him for having it off with another woman. Then there was another innkeeper nearby in competition, and she changed him into a frog. Now the old man swims in the vat of his own wine and hides in the dregs and calls out humbly to his past customers with raucous croaks. And because he spoke against her, she turned a lawyer into a sheep. And now as a sheep, he pleads his case. When the wife of a lover of hers who was carrying at the time, insulted her wittily, she condemned her to a perpetual pregnancy by closing her womb to prevent the birth. And according to everyone's computation, that poor woman's been burdened for eight years or more, and she's as big as an elephant. As it kept happening and many were harmed, public indignation grew, and the people decreed the severest punishment, stoning to death the next day. But... With the power of her chanting, she thwarted their plan. Just as Medea, in that one short day she won from Creon, consumed his daughter, his palace, and the old king himself in the flames of from the golden crown, so Miro, by chanting necromantic rites in a ditch, as she told me herself when she was drunk, shut all the people in their houses with the dumb force of her magic powers. For two whole days, not one of them could break the locks, rip open the doors, or even dig a way through the walls, until at last, at everyone's mutual urging, they called out, swearing a solemn oath not to lay hands on her themselves, and to come to her defense and save her if anyone tried to do so. Thus propitiated, she freed the whole town. But as for the author of the original decree, she snatched him up in the dead of night 
with his whole house, that's walls and floor and foundations entire, and shifted them, the door still locked, a hundred miles to another town on the top of a rugged and arid mountain. And since the densely packed homes of those folk left no room for the new guest, she dropped the house in front of the gates and vanished. What you relate is marvelous, dear Socrates, I said, and wild. In short, you've roused no little anxiety, even fear, in me too. I'm struck with no mere pebble here, but a spear, lest, with the aid of those same magic forces, that old woman might have heard our conversation. So let's go to bed early, and weariness relieved by sleep, leave before dawn, and get as far away as we can. This has been an excerpt from The Golden Ass on Historical Humans Reads. If you enjoyed this video and would like to hear more excerpts from original texts, please subscribe to be notified of the next one. If there is a work you would like to hear, be sure to like the video and leave a comment listing it below. Thank you for listening.